Well, good morning and welcome to our service this morning. It's wonderful to uh, see uh, familiar faces here in live, if you like, and uh, online. Um, and as we gather uh, online or here in this building to worship our Lord, we gather before the same God, a God who is present wherever we are at the moment with us um, by his spirit. Um, and as we come before our God to worship him, I'm going to be reading from Psalm 62. Psalm 62, verses 1 to 8. Psalm 62. For the director of music, for Jedithon, a psalm of David. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Would all of you throw him down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? They fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Selah, find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Selah. Let's come before our God in prayer to him. Oh, precious God, we, we come before you. We come before you, the almighty God, who alone is eternal, who alone is from everlasting to everlasting, whose throne is established from of old. Indeed, oh God, we come before you to worship you wherever we are, in our hearts, not just with our lips. Indeed, oh God, we pray that with our mouths we would bless and with our hearts we would bless as well. That indeed, oh Lord, even as we gather this morning, separately and together in one sense, we pray, oh God, that our hearts would find their hope and their rest in you alone. Indeed, oh God, you alone are our rock and our salvation. You are our fortress. We cannot be shaken. Our salvation and our honour depend on you. You are our mighty rock. You are the one we can trust at all times. Indeed, O oh God, be with us, even as we hear your word, even as we sing, O oh God. Please comfort our hearts, strengthen our hearts, and help them to find their rest in you. We pray, O oh God, as we hear your word this morning, that our hearts would resonate with your word, that our hearts would find joy in your word. And that we would delight in it as much as in all riches. We do indeed pray that, that you would be with Joel as he preaches your word. Help him to preach your word with, with an eye for your glory. Yours alone. That indeed he may present your word and may he may preach it faithfully. And that he might show us the Lord Jesus Christ. That indeed our hearts may be strengthened in him. Lord, we pray all these things. And we commit our time now into your hands. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to sing. If you would like at home and here we can stand. And we're going to sing, All Glory Be to Christ.
now time for our announcements, our notices, uh, the first of which uh, is that as usual at the moment all church activities uh, normally open to the public are cancelled for the moment due to the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, next, uh, these 10 a.m. Sunday services will continue uh, via a live stream on Zoom and feel free to, to invite uh, your families and friends and those who maybe even don't normally go to church. Uh, I know that there are some of you who are, who are inviting family members. Um, next, the 5.30 p.m. Sunday prayer meeting is on today uh, with a 10-person limit here, uh, but also with Zoom connections. If you would like to come physically uh, to this Sunday prayer service, uh, please let uh, Joel know. Next, uh, the first baptism class uh, is on this afternoon from 2 p.m. via Zoom. Um, Next, the 7.30 p.m. Tuesday night Bible study is on uh, again this coming week uh, via Zoom, and we're going through the Psalms, and it's been wonderful to go through them, uh, and everyone is welcome to join, so uh, please do join us for that. Uh, next, the 4 p.m. Friday uh, Bible story time for kids is on fortnightly, and it's on this Friday, the 29th, via Zoom. Uh, next, any details for any Zoom meeting that we have um, please, if you want details for that, uh, please see Joel. And lastly, uh, church offerings uh, that members uh, can give to the work of the Lord and support this church uh, and Joel at this time uh, can be made via direct deposit uh, and you can see the details there on the screen. I'd now like to ask Joel forward for the children's door. Thanks, Joel. Yes, if children would like to come closer to uh, the TV in their room or whatever screen you are using. Today we're going to hear again from the Beginner's Gospel Story Bible by Jared Kennedy. We've been having a few stories from this over the last few weeks. And this week we're going to go back to the Old Testament and hear about something that happened in the time of Moses. So the Bible story begins, Moses took God's people to a big mountain. You see him going up the mountain? And Moses climbed up the mountain and God spoke to Moses for days and days. He gave Moses his law and commandments on stone tablets. One of God's commandments said, do not believe in or worship any pretend gods. We should not have any other gods before our God. So Moses is up on the mountain. Meanwhile, what's happening down below at the bottom of the mountain? Moses stayed on the mountain for a long time. He stayed so long that the people worried he would not come back. So Moses' brother Aaron said to the people, give me all of your gold things, earrings and necklaces and coins. You see them all there? Now what's he going to do with all that gold? Aaron melted the gold in a fire and shaped it into a baby cow, a golden calf. Then the people had a party. 
they praised and worshipped the golden calf and said, this is our God who saved us from Egypt. But was it a gold calf, a baby cow that had saved the Israelites from Pharaoh? No. Oh, no, the people didn't love God best. Oh, no, the people disobeyed God's law. Moses hurried down the mountain with God's stone tablets. See him coming down the mountain with his stone tablets? Moses saw the people. He was angry with his brother Aaron. He threw the stone tablets to the ground and they broke into pieces. Then Moses said to Aaron, what have you done? Why did you disobey God? Aaron lied. The people gave me the gold. I threw it into the fire. Then this calf just popped out. Is that really what happened? No, he made the golden calf, but he's saying that it just came out. Now, we've got to be very careful ourselves with the ideas that people can say to us as well. We live in a world where people are going to mislead us, just as Aaron misled the people long ago, the Israelites, and then he said things that were not true, deceitful to Moses. We have to be careful as well. And that's what we're going to hear about in the sermon today, is that we have to watch out, Paul tells the, the Christians in Colossae, uh, the Colossians. He tells them to watch out that no one leads you astray, makes you captive by empty and deceitful ideas or philosophies. We have to be very careful that we don't get led astray. How do we make sure that we're not led astray? Well, the way to continue to know what is the right and true thing to do in every situation, to not worship a golden cow like some people might like you to do, like Aaron wanted the Israelites to do so many years ago, is by continuing to look to Jesus all the time. If we learn about Jesus from his word and from his people again and again, we will see the foolishness of worshipping a golden calf or any other idea that comes along that people want to mislead us with. And so I encourage you to do that while you are still young. Continue to read God's word, learn as much as you can about the one who is faithful and true, not deceitful and false like a golden calf. And the one who is faithful and true is, of course, the Lord Jesus. All right, you can go back to your seats and we're going to hear from God's word. We are indeed going to be hearing from God's word as it is read. So I'll be reading from uh, Jeremiah 23. Uh, Jeremiah 23, uh, starting at verse 16 and going through to verse 32. Jeremiah 23, verses 16 to 32. Verse 16. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says, you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord? and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill 
heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets say, who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will they continue? How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name. Just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream. But let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces? Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I do not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. This is God's word. It's now time for our pastoral prayer. This is time to come before our God in prayer. Let's speak with him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are our rock of refuge, our strong fortress. We recognize that our times are in your hands. Your face shines on your servants and you save us in your unfailing love. Great is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men on those who take refuge in you. But Lord, as we come before you and recognize your blessing upon your servants and that you continue to surround your people with love, we must confess that we do not commit our spirits into your hands as we should. We so often think our times are in our hands rather than in your hands. And we are in the masters of our lives. We are in control of our lives. And so we often will cling to worthless idols. We slander our brothers and sisters and conspire against one another. We think that by our own words, we can control others. We have lying lips and we speak proudly and arrogantly against those who are more righteous than us. And so, Lord, as we come before you and we recognize your great power, we recognize how often we have tried to seize your power and we have done it sinfully. We have in our motive, but also in the means by which we have tried to seize your power. We have lied, we have been deceitful, we have abused our fellow man. And so, Lord, we come before you recognizing our sins and ask for forgiveness. Hear our cry for mercy and our calls for help. Take pity on our groaning and our tears of sorrow as we consider our sins against you, the mighty God. O oh Lord, redeem us again from our sins and cover over our unrighteousness with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Do not hand us over to the enemy, but set our feet in a spacious place upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the cornerstone upon whom we can have a firm foundation and come before you boldly, even despite our treacherous ways. Oh, Lord, forgive us and help us to stand on Christ and be acceptable in your eyes this morning as we seek to worship and honor you. Lord, we also come before you in the name of Jesus Christ and ask for your blessing upon your work going on throughout the world. And we think particularly of our missionaries. We think of the Joneses uh, serving in the Philippines. Lord, we pray for Heaven and Janet and for their daughter, Rhiannon. We pray that they would always thank you in their prayers as they remember the work that you are doing through them. Oh, Lord, we pray that they would overflow with thankfulness to yourself. May they thank you for the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ of the Filipino believers whom they've gotten to know over the years. And Lord, we pray that they would thank you for the love the Filipino people have shown them and have shown all the saints. Oh Lord, we pray that the Filipino people uh, would continue to have a great faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that their love would increase and grow for each other and also for those outside the church. And so Lord, we pray that you would send revival through the Philippines and use heaven and Janet to advance your kingdom mightily in that place. 
Lord, we also pray for our own country this morning and we pray for our government. Lord, we thank you for our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. We thank you for our premiers here in this, uh, this land of our, our various states. Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom to our government as they seek to protect us from the coronavirus and the economic impacts that come as a result of the changes that they've made, the restrictions that they've put in place. Lord, we pray that Christian politicians would be encouraging people to call upon you for further relief. Oh, Lord, we pray that Christian politicians may be active in sharing their faith and giving you thanks and glory without fear of what the public may think. And so, Lord, we pray that there would be a real Christian spirit shown within our government at this time as we seek to help the, the people of this, this nation, the Australian people, to overcome the sickness that is prevalent amongst us, but also to be able to help one another as we manage this crisis together. And, Lord, we do pray that restrictions would be lifted because... Uh, the coronavirus is under control. Lord, we pray that we'd have the joy of having more and more people worshipping you Sunday by Sunday, even in this building, because you have, you have restrained the, the sickness from spreading and so that we can come and worship you with freedom again. Lord, we also pray for other churches here in Sydney. We thank you that we are not alone in Sydney, but there are many brothers and sisters in Christ gathering in your name Sunday by Sunday. Lord, we pray for our reform, uh, for the Reformed Presbyterian and Congregational Churches here in Sydney. Oh, Lord, we pray that they would have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ Jesus. And may they have a great joy and encouragement from yourself as they see the love of Christians around them. And so, Lord, we pray that their hearts and their spirits would be refreshed as they see what you are doing in their midst. Lord, we also pray for our own suburb this morning. We think of the suburb of Dremoyne. Oh, Lord, we pray that the Christians who live in this area would appeal to the Dremoyne community on the basis of love. Oh, Lord, we pray that the Christians here would speak much of the love of Christ and that we would see many here in Dremoyne coming to embrace Christ's love themselves and then going on to speak of the love of Christ to others as well. And so, Lord, we pray that people who receive the seed of your word and the love of Jesus would go on to produce fruit. Uh, even 30, 60, 100 fold. And so that more and more people are calling upon your name as they should here in Dremoyne. Lord, we also pray for our own church this morning. We thank you for Dremoyne Baptist and we pray that you would use us to advance your kingdom mightily here in Dremoyne, but also around the world and in Australia. Oh Lord, we pray that you'd be raising up pastors and missionaries from our own church, that our children would be growing up to love the Lord Jesus and want to take him to the ends of the earth. Lord, we pray that we'd be able to support and produce those who are willing to help in the furtherance of your kingdom. And Lord, we pray that we have the joy of sending people out with our blessing because they go in the name of Christ to capture people for yourself. Lord, we also pray for those in our church who are unwell, who are suffering in different ways, who have even made it, have found it difficult to tune in this morning and to be with us as we come to worship you. Lord, we pray that they would know that your grace is sufficient for them, that your power is made perfect in weakness. And so, Lord, we pray that when we suffer in this church, that we would boast all the more gladly about our weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on us. May we know that when we are weak, then we are strong. And we pray this particularly for those who are suffering amongst us even this morning. Lord, we also pray for us as a church that we would be people who take the gospel to wherever we can in the different relationships that we have with people. And we pray particularly for family members who are unsaved, Oh, Lord, we pray that our family members may be our very heart. And, Lord, we pray that we would then not be able to help but share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. May we love them so dearly that we want to continue to share with them the way of salvation as found in the blood of Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that our family members may become even more dear to us because they have become brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd be doing this, using us and then changing hearts in our families, so that they love yourself. Lord, we also pray for the members of this church as a whole. We thank you for those who have committed themselves to yourself, but also to the brethren here. Lord, we pray that our love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And we pray that this would happen so that we may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, 
And so that then we are filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would do this, make our love abound and increase our discernment and insight and fill us with the fruit of righteousness through Christ. We pray that you would do all this for your glory and for your praise. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're now going to sing our second song. We worship at your feet. From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world. No, sorry, we worship at your feet, the chorus, where wrath and mercy meet, and a guilty world is washed by love's pure stream. For us he was made sin, oh, help me take it in. Deep wounds of love cry out, Father, forgive. I worship, I worship the lamb who was slain. Please stand and worship the lamb who was slain.
It's time now for our second Bible reading. Our second Bible reading comes from Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 1 through to verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 1 through to verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith, in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross." Let's come to God in prayer. Let's speak with him. Heavenly Father, we come before you and ask that you would act amongst us this morning. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for your law is being broken. We see it all around in our world and even in our own nation and even in our own lives. So we ask that you would act this morning by sending your spirit so that we don't break your law and so that we can encourage others to keep your royal law for themselves. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we continue our series in the book of Colossians, and we're up to chapter 2 now. We've been learning uh, what the Apostle Paul has to say to this church, uh, which he probably never visited, but he had heard of, and so he sent them a letter to be an encouragement to them, and he spoke wonderfully about their faith and their love that he is very thankful for, and about the Lord Jesus Christ and who Jesus is. And then we've been looking at his, uh, last week we saw his purpose, uh, what he desires to do, that he is the one who is, has been given a commission to present to the world and to the Colossians as well, the word of God in its fullness. That was back in chapter 1, verse 25. I've become its servant by the commission God gave to me, uh, me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. And so we looked at that last week and what it means to proclaim Christ and so that people will be perfect. Uh, that's what he says in verse 28. We proclaim him, that's Jesus, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. And we looked at what a struggle that is for the Apostle Paul to present Christ to others and what a struggle it is for us as well. And so he goes on to speak about how it is a struggle for him in chapter 2. He continues and looking at what that looks like when people are presented as perfect in Christ. In verse 2 of chapter 2, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. This is what it means to be perfect in Christ, to be mature in him, that you would be encouraged in heart, united in love and have the full riches of complete understanding. And then he goes on about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he starts to speak about what, part of the other reason why he's written this letter. And that's in verse four. He says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. 
Paul is writing to the church in Colossae because it appears that some heresy has broken out within the church. And we're going to start studying that in closer detail in the weeks to come and even this morning. And that's what the Apostle Paul wants to warn the Colossians about. And so he goes on to speak about how they should be uh, firmly fixed in Christ in verses 6 and 7. And then in verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. And that's what I want to look at particularly this morning is that verse 8 there and the danger that the church in Colossae faced and that we face today as well. We need to see to it. We need to watch out. What do we need to watch out for? That no one takes us captive. The Greek word that is translated there as captive there is used in reference to kidnapping or taking spoils in war. And so there's people who are around the Colossians at this time, and they're wanting to take them captive, even enslave them. How are they going to do this? Well, the tactics that the kidnappers use are hollow or empty, deceptive philosophies. We see that in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. There are people who are seeking to lure the Colossians away from Christ with teachings that aren't true or even deliberately deceitful. The people know that what they're teaching is false, but they're wanting to drag the Colossians away and follow after them. Why are these philosophies so false? Well, it's because of the origin of these philosophies that are being presented to the Colossian church. We see that in verse eight, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. These heresies that were being presented to the church in Colossae were dependent upon human tradition. In other words, somebody somewhere had made it up. A human was the origin of these philosophies, these ideas, these heresies that were being presented to the church in Colossae. And it's similar to uh, what we heard warned about in Jeremiah chapter 23, that reading that we had before for us. It's been something that's been going on uh, since uh, man was on this earth uh, after the fall, that people are making up false ideas all the time. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 16, uh, we see the prophet Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. People have been making up false ideas uh, that have been coming down through the ages in the time of Jeremiah as well, and here in the church in Colossae as well. And the Apostle Paul wants to warn such people, uh, the Colossian church, about such people. And it's not just that they come from human tradition, but we also see that they depend upon the basic principles of this world in verse 8. What does that mean? Well, commentators uh, struggle to understand what is actually being suggested there in the original Greek, uh, but it's probably most likely a reference to the demonic that the basic principles of this world are referring to the evil forces of the demons and, of course, the prince of demons, Satan himself. And that's what's going on within the church in Colossae, is that heresies are coming in that are not only being made up by humans, but are being encouraged by the deceitfulness of demons. Now, what is the way for the church in Colossae to tell if these teachings are false? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us at the end of verse 8 what teaching should depend upon. It shouldn't depend upon human tradition. It shouldn't depend upon the basic principles of this world, but it should depend upon Christ. Christ is the one by which we can tell if something is an empty, a hollow, and deceptive philosophy. And this is good advice for us today. It's not just good advice for the early church, uh, the church in Colossae. It's good advice for us today because many still want to take us captive, to kidnap us and take us away from Jesus Christ. I've even seen it in my life. It's people have been led away from the Lord Jesus. They've said they affirmed Christ. They confess Christ as their savior, but then they are led away. They are led captive by others. How do kidnappers take them away from Jesus Christ? Well, it's by empty philosophies and deceptive ideas that they get into people's heads and they spread these evil ideas towards them. 
And what is the foundation of such philosophies? Well, we still see it's the same foundation that was there in the church in Colossae so many years ago, that it depend, these, these false ideas depend on human traditions and the basic principles of this world. We see that so many of these ideas that come along, that drag people away from Christ, we can see their origin in man. We look at the false religions of the world. And we see how they are started by man. You can usually go back to one individual who has kicked it all off. And they often appeal to someone by appealing to their pride and through rules. You see this with most of the false religions of the world. They love to have extensive rules. And this, I think, is what uh, was going on in the church in Colossae, as we will look at in coming weeks, about the different rules that are given uh, from verse 16 and following. And down in verse 20, the Apostle Paul speaks about it again. In verse 20, he says, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, that same word uh, that is used for uh, the foundation of these false ideas that are coming in in verse 8, the basic principles of this world, why as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And you see this with a lot of false teachings that are out there. They have very extensive rules. They're appealing to your pride that if you do these things, then you will be right with God. They have rules about your time, about attendance with things and volunteering and who you can see, which family members you're allowed to meet with, which friends you're allowed to see. They have rules about what you are to do with your money. They have rules, extensive rules about what you can wear, what you can eat, what you can read, what you can watch, what sort of music you can listen to, who you can listen to speaking. They have extensive rules. And so they're founded on man. They love to come up with rules. We see that in the early church. Well, we see it in the time of Jesus with the Pharisees. Extensive rules that man has made up. Jesus is very careful to point that out. They're traditions taught by men. And so there's not a lot of freedom when you look at these false religions that come along to make your mind up about certain things. There's not liberty to examine yourself and to come up with your own way. You have a liberty of conscience as a Christian to work out what you will do with your time and with your energy and with your money. Another example of uh, Philosophy that takes over today, uh, satanic philosophy that's more satanic than we look at some of the false religions of the world that is very popular today, is eroticism. It appears to be against rules. This is at the other extreme. One end says, oh, you've got to keep these rules. Another extreme can be what we call antinomianism, where you reject all rules. And we see this with eroticism, that there's sexual freedom, but it's actually quite enslaving. It does take you captive. We see with those false religions that they take you captive by all the rules that they have. But we see with eroticism that it takes you captive as well. You see that more and more time and money is given over to your lusts as you go into a spiral, particularly with pornography. You see that pornography, it takes more and more time from people as they continue to engage in it. And it doesn't stay in a cage. You think that you can have that as a private sphere of your life, but it starts to affect your thoughts about everything, including people, what you think of other humans, and what you think of God. And so we see the Satanism that is behind it as it proclaims freedom, sexual freedom, but instead is leading to more and more captivity for the person who is ensnared in it. So we, like the church in Colossae so many years ago, we must remember that we're like fish swimming in a big ocean. And much of the teaching that we eat is from God's spirit and is delightfully rich and good for us. But there are evil fishermen about we need to see to it that we are not made captive to them. They have very attractive lures, but the lures are hollow or empty, we could say, with no food at all inside them, and they do not satisfy. I actually watched a, a clip on the internet this week of a, a fisherman trying to catch fish with lures, and they're just plastic hollow devices that could float on the top of the water. There are actually nothing in them whatsoever other than air. They're very attractive to the fish. He was able to catch quite a few fish with one of these lures in the few minutes that I watched him as he threw it out on the water. But there was no food for those fish that bit down on those empty lures. And the lures are deceitful. They've got a hook in them that captures us for a net. And eventually, for those fish that I was watching, for stomach acid, where they will burn. And that's the same for us today. We've got to be very careful with the different philosophies that come along, the different religions, the false ideas that come along. They've got a hook in them and they hook us and they capture us for a net and drag us away 
not for the pain, the burning of stomach acid, but for the fires of hell for all eternity. So we need to be alert, like Paul was wanting the Colossians to be alert so many years ago. We need to be alert and recognize the lures of men and demons when they come along. So how do we do it? How do we spot false teachings? Well, we could learn a lot about false philosophies and false religions, but there are so many new ones. And there are new spins on old ones all the time. You could get a book on world religions and we could start studying one every week. And we could do it week after week after week. And we could do it for five years, every Sunday. Look at a different false religion, a different philosophy, a false idea that is out there. And we could go on and on and on and on. Is that what we're supposed to do? So that we're not made captive. We're meant to look at as many lures as possibly, if possible so that we can recognize them and so we can stay away from them. Well, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul didn't go into extensive detail about the heresy that was in the Colossian church. We'll get some details in weeks to come as we look at the rest of chapter 2. But it's very interesting that he's almost deliberately vague. And it's put scholars into a real spin over the centuries to try and work out what was the precise heresy that was going on in the Colossian church. They look at all the different heresies that we know of that were around in the first century and they say, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And they try and work out what exactly it is. But the Apostle Paul doesn't seem to be too concerned to label it and to speak about particular teachers that were teaching false ideas so that the Colossians would watch out for that teacher. So how does the Apostle Paul want us to spot the false ideas when they come along, when people try to lure us away from the Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't there a general way which we could prepare ourselves so that we're not snagged by false ideas? Well, yes, there is. The best way to recognize counterfeits is to handle the genuine a lot and to compare to the genuine. And what is the genuine? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this across the board. Whenever you want to uh, compare something, whether it's a fake, to uh, you want to know if something's a fake, you, you look at what the genuine looks like. I even saw this this week. I was out getting some milk late at night. I went down to a grocery store near us, and I had to wait a while, even though there was nobody in the store uh, whatsoever, no other customers, but there were two checkout uh, girls, and they were intently poring over something at one of the checkouts. And eventually they said, oh, yes, come over, buy your milk. And I went over and I asked what they were doing because I could see all this money laid out. And uh, they had found a counterfeit note uh, as they were cleaning out the tills for the end of the evening. And what were they doing? They had all these $50 notes spread out across the counter. And then they had one in the middle of it, which they could tell by, it was a fact, and the girl said, I could tell because it's slightly different yellow shade. It was a very, they held it up for me to see. It was quite interesting that they let a customer come over where it must have been about $1,000 just spread out across the counter in $50 notes. But what were they doing? They had multiple notes there, genuine notes, and they were comparing it to the one that they suspected as fake. And that they could tell because it was just slightly more yellow than all the others. You could pick it out straight away once you put it amongst 10. If you put it just with one, it would have been difficult to spot. But because they had so many genuine articles there, they were able to see it. And that is the case for us today. We need to ask when any teaching comes along, whenever you read any book, whenever you listen to any preacher, whenever you come across any person that is teaching you something, you need to compare that person what to? You need to compare that person to Christ. That's what G, uh, the Apostle Paul says in verse 8, really. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. Christ is the one that you're meant to look at. Is this teaching that I am hearing about dependent upon Christ? What does this teacher say about Christ? We should be asking of every idea that comes our way, what think ye of Christ? Not necessarily what ye think ye of God, but what think ye of Christ? Although asking what think ye of God is a very important question. But remember, these people are deceitful. We see that in verse 8. They, and they, they take you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. And they will happily say that they believe in God. They will say all kinds of things about God. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, he is often the stumbling block. He is the sticking point. He is the thing that 
the false teachers just cannot stomach. They cannot swallow. They cannot say what is true about Jesus Christ. And so what do we ask of the philosophies of the world when they come our way? What do we ask them about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the big light to shine on the lures of this world is what does a teacher say about Christ's divinity? And it's very interesting that that's the very next thing that the Apostle Paul speaks about in verse 9. After speaking about false ideas, what does he do? Verse 9, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, when, who is the head over every power and authority. The big light to shine on the lures of the world is, what do you say about Christ and his divinity? Will you say that Jesus is God? Not just a prophet, not just a nice moral teacher, but is he God? And you will see that so many of these ideas that are out there that are trying to take you captive cannot bring themselves to say, Jesus is God. God. And the Apostle John teaches this same principle as we test the spirits of this world. 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4 verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. How do you recognize the Spirit of God? 1 John chapter 4 says, Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. How do you recognize if a spirit is false, if a teacher is false? Ask them, did God come in human flesh? And watch many of them crumble away. And this goes for the demonic as well. I was reading an interesting story about, uh, in a, uh, uh, a book about uh, one particular preacher, but it also has an account of, from a biography of a missionary, G. Whitfield Guinness. G. Whitfield Guinness, not George Whitfield, uh, but probably uh, the G is there for George. George Whitfield Guinness, uh, and his early experience with the demonic. I'll read, the biography of G. Whitfield Guinness, for instance, tells us of what happened when he and others from a Christian background attended a seance while students at Cambridge. So they're in this seance. For about 20 minutes, nothing particular happened. The table round which they were seated gave no response to the questions put to it, and they were getting distinctly tired. Just two minutes more, urged the medium, the table began to move a little, round and round, then rolled right over and across the room. Aroused to interest, the group began to ply it with questions. Two bangs on the floor meant no, and three bangs on the floor meant yes. One asked, one of the people in the group at the seance, asked whether his brother had just passed his examination. He had just received the news himself. The table gave the right answer. Another wanted to know the number of books on a bookshelf over which a curtain was hanging. It was not the medium's room. The table said 49, which proved to be exactly right. For almost an hour, they, that's the people in the seance, went on showering questions of this table, all of which were correctly answered. Greatly intrigued, they now came to more serious matters and asked, how long it would take for them to become initiated, how many seances they would have to attend before they could be considered mediums themselves. Whitfield Guinness was told 13 or 14 times. A strange consciousness of some unseen power was stealing over them all. Whitfield began to be uneasy. Then he remembered the passage, 1 John 4, 1 to 3. Try or test the spirits, whether they are of God. Every spirit which confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that which confesseth not Jesus is not of God. Quietly, he put the question, Has Jesus Christ, the Son of God, come in the flesh? The table rose right up about two feet high and crashed out an unmistakable no. No. That broke up the atmosphere, and for Whitfield put an end to tampering with spiritualism. 
Some who went on with it had grave cause to regret the first steps by which they became enslaved. But he went on to become a medical missionary in China. Many, many of the false ideas that are out there and even the demonic can be quickly dismissed if we will simply ask what they believe about Christ's divinity. Has the Son of God taken on flesh and dwelt amongst humanity? But what if a philosophy affirms Christ is divine? What if they say, yes, the Son of God has taken on flesh and dwelt amongst humanity? What else could we ask to see if a false religion is really a lure trying to take us away from Christ? Well, we should ask, what does a teacher say about Christ's work of reconciliation? And that's what the Apostle Paul goes on to speak of in verses 11 and following. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. We were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You want to know if an idea is false? Ask what it makes of Christ and his reconciling work. Is Christ alone the way of salvation by faith? Or is there something else They may even say, yes, Christ is the way of salvation. Yes, you've got to trust in Jesus. But then they usually have a plus on there if they are a false religion. They will say, but you need to also do this as well. Yes, believe in Christ, but do this. Jesus plus something. And quickly, you're able to see whether something is simply a lure that is trying to make you captive and lead you away from Christ. So there are two ways by which you can discern whether an idea that has come across your path, a teaching that has come across your path, a book that has come across your path is really seeking to take you captive and is empty and false. And at this point, I must then ask you, have you already been snagged? Have you already been taken captive by some false philosophy that is out there? What think ye of Christ? Do you not believe that Christ is God? that the word became flesh? Do you not believe that Christ alone is the saviour of sin and death and the judgment that is to come? If you can't affirm that Jesus is God, if you can't affirm that Jesus is the only way of salvation, don't you see that you've already been made captive, that you've been kidnapped through a hollow and deceptive philosophy that has come across your path in some way and that you will one day be carried off to hell for eternity? Don't let it be. Fight against the captors. Get the hook out of your mouth. Trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation before it's too late. Start affirming that Jesus is God. Start affirming that Jesus is the only way of salvation. Believe in him and have eternal life in his name. But if we do believe in Christ, we may still feel somewhat overwhelmed by all the teaching, all the materials that are out there. There are so many false ideas around. There are so many false religions. There are so many people who are speaking about the things of God and the things of this world. How do we have greater discernment? Well, what does Apostle Paul tell us to do in verse 6? Verse 6, so then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. We need to handle the genuine regularly. Not just once, not just know Christ a few times, but we need to handle him regularly. And so then we'll easily spot fakes. We need to be like bankers and not grocers. What do I mean? Well, the girls down at the grocery store, they don't handle notes as much as bankers. They don't handle the the money as much as the bankers do. And I would say that most people who produce counterfeit money do not try to bank them at the bank. They go to a grocery store like the one I visited. Why? Because it's usually a younger person that's working there, handles other things through the day, not just money, and is less likely to notice that they have a fake. 
And so we need to be people who regularly handle Christ so that, of course, we spot any false teaching that's coming a mile off. We need to joyfully look at Christ and feed upon him. Christ is not empty. He is not deceitful. He is solid food. He is not a lure that is empty on the, so in the inside. He is not deceitful with a hook hanging out. He is true. And as we enjoy looking at Christ, we'll find the lures not just false that are out there, but actually repulsive. We won't be attracted to them at all. The songwriter Lemel's advice is good advice. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The things of this world that try to capture us will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace because we've turned our eyes upon the Lord Jesus and looked full in his wonderful face. So how can we enjoy looking at Christ more and more? Well, we can study Christ best by listening to what he says about himself in his word. We need to look at his word and see Christ in every passage of scripture, in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. At Bible study on Tuesday nights, at the moment we're studying the Psalms. It seems to be the most logical choice of the time while uh, we've got unsettled uh, times that we're living in. And also it makes it a bit easier, I think, uh, for us to do something uh, electronically online to have the study. Uh, but even in the Psalms, we are asking, what can we learn about Jesus each week? We have a series of questions that we work through, the same questions every week as we look at a different psalm. And one of those questions is, what do we learn about Jesus? And I'm not talking about Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 45, we talk so wonderfully about the Lord Jesus Christ as a king, the king of God. Uh, and, of course, Psalm 110 the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, and of course, reference to Melchizedek. I'm not talking about those Psalms. I'm talking about all the Psalms that we've been looking at. As we see a reference to the right hand, a right hand, we think of Jesus at the right hand of God. When we see a reference to the cup of the Lord or a cup of wrath, what do we think of? We think of Jesus in Gethsemane. Wherever we are in the Bible, we can make a connection to the Lord Jesus Christ in some way. We can learn something more about Christ. We can handle more of Jesus so that we can spot the fakes when they come along. How else can we look at Christ so we spot the lures of the world? Well, we can joyfully study Christ, not just in his word, but also in his people because Christ resides in them. In them. And this is taught to us even in uh, this passage that we've been looking at in, in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 10, uh, chapter, chapter 2, verse 10, verse 10 of chapter 2, you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised. Again and again, we see that we are in Christ. Back in verse 27 of chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 27, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Christ is in his people, which means as we gather with his people, as we look at his people, we can learn about Christ. Christ reveals himself in his preachers, in his authors, the people who write books about him, and of course, in all his people. And that's why times of fellowship are so sweet for us, because... We study Christ moving amongst his people when we gather with brothers and sisters in Christ. And Christ is especially present when his people gather for worship. We have the promise that where two or three gather in his name, he is amongst them. And that Christ is truly among his people when they gather to worship him. And this is where I'm sorry to say that online teleconferencing doesn't cut it in the same way. It doesn't cut it in the same way. I dare say that a Christian who fellowships only online over the long term is a greater risk to capture because they're not around God's people in the same way that when we come face to face and we can see so much more. I can see a little bit of you on the screen today, but I can't see as much as I can of the people who I'm gathering with face to face. I can see more of Christ in them, in the way that they interact after the service, that the way they speak to one another than I can over the internet. And this is why we must pray for the lockdown to be lifted so that we can safely come back. We must desire to come back 
and be in Christ's presence as we were again. Do you desire this? Do you long to handle the genuine by being around brothers and sisters in Christ so that you can spot the lures of this world? I, may, I even encourage you this afternoon to come to the prayer meeting. We're allowed to have 10 people. We didn't make the full 10 last week. There was a privilege that was available for you to come and see Christ in his people as they came and they bowed their heads in prayer to God. You could have learned something about Christ last week if you'd come to that prayer meeting. You're welcome to come this afternoon at 5.30. Just let me know in advance so that we don't have more than 10 people and break the government guidelines. But... I'm sure there'll be a few empty chairs available. Come and see Christ. Study Christ this afternoon as his people gather in his name. So are you fish who are alert to the lures of men and demons? Are you seeing to it, as it says in verse 8, that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy? Are you ones who handle the genuine? You handle Christ so much that you can easily spot the hollow and deceitful philosophy that is seeking to take you captive. Or do you have to make up for some lost time and handle the genuine far more than you have been so that you see to it that no one takes you captive and drags you away to hell for all eternity? Let's come to God in prayer. Let's speak to him. Heavenly Father, we praise you as the one who is not hollow, who is not deceptive. We ask that you would forgive us for not being as wary as we should and for swallowing far too many of the world's lures that have just proven to be hollow, that have just proven to be deceptive. We ask that you would help us to enjoy spending so much time looking at Christ that we can see through false teachings when they come our way and that we would handle Christ so much and love him so dearly and enjoy him so much that we would find the lures of this world and of demons instantly repulsive, not just unattractive. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our final song. It's the Servant King. And it says in verse 1, From heaven you came, helpless babe, speaking of Jesus, entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served but to serve and give your life that we might live. This is our God, the Servant King, who calls us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the Servant King. Please stand and sing that Jesus is your God.
with words from the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, where he ends his letter. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen.